from Relay FM, this is Upgrade, episode 484 for October 31st, Halloween, the spookiest episode of the year. This episode is brought to you by Ladder, Delete Me Notion, and Vitally. I am the man previously known as Mike Hurley, and I am joined by the spookiest co-host of all, Jason Snell. 484! (laughs) 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 Because it's spooky for no reason, as we have learned over the last 24 hours, that there is absolutely zero (laughs) point for it. But we'll get to that shortly. This is your regularly scheduled program. I have a Mm. Snell Talk question for you, Jason Snell, that comes from Jimmy, who wants to know, Jason... Did you write the Six Colors articles about the Apple event last night from your cold garage or from Studio B? And also, what tea were you drinking to be so caffeinated to write so much? Well, Jimmy, I got news for you. Neither. I wrote my article about the Apple event uh, last night, yesterday, Mm -hmm. at a hotel room in New York City. Yes. And while waiting for my flight at the Newark airport. And at the Newark airport, I was drinking a Diet Mountain Dew. And then I flew home, and the event happened while I was on an airplane. Yep. True story revealed here. Mm -hmm. So you had the opportunity to go to a place in New York and have some conversations and take a look at some products. Apple type people the uh, event that we're talking about. Uh, We had a selection of people ask questions along this line, and it is also very important to worth note because people ask, this all happened after draft stuff. There was no information known before the draft. Yes, exactly. So There you go. So So when we talk about this stuff today, understand that Jason has a bit more information than your average because he's seen it. He's actually been there, and you've you've actually seen, touched... Some I, I've actually used. tried to get my fingerprints on the thing that has the reduced fingerprints. So you essentially had like a hands-on area kind of kind of vibey thing, right? Is uh, the best way well, to put it. it was a. I would say it's a briefing. I yeah. had a product briefing yeah, where we even better. W- we were we were shown the products and allowed to get our hands on them and talk to Apple representatives mm-hmm. um, in a couple of different locations. Uh, in the venue and uh, and got the got the details, got to ask some questions, got to, you know, sometimes get some answers that were sometimes I, I got I asked some questions. I got very satisfying answers from and uh, others that, you know, they're not going to talk about. And I knew they were not going to talk about it. Yep. But, you know, sometimes you got to ask. So, yeah. So this was actually uh, pretty big news. Oh, by the way, if you'd like to send in a Snell Talk question of your own, it's very simple. Just go to upgradefeedback.com and you can send one in to help us start a future episode. Thank you, Jimmy, for your question. Jimmy, so, you were set up, Jimmy. You were set up there mm-hmm. by Mike. So uh, I was going to say, it's been actually a pretty big news week, and I just wanted to make a little programming note. So next week's episode, we'll be talking about Apple's quarterly results. And my plan is that hopefully we'll be able to talk about all of the stuff that came out in the 17.2 beta, because there was actually quite a lot of stuff, including the journaling app and tap backs. And I want to talk about all of that. Mm -hmm. But obviously, we don't have the space for that today, but that will hopefully form part of next week's episode, would be my hope. We do have to talk about the draft results, though. Yeah. That, I mean, that's pretty important. We do. We did badly. Um, so, you won on yeah. a tie break. I, I was talking to Adina about this <laughs> last night because she, she wanted to know uh, how I'd done in the draft. And basically, the way that I look at what happened in this draft is essentially the result of the ideal, right? Like... The ideal draft scenario is kind of what happened, which is that we were operating on our own knowledge, our own uh, uh, guesses and rumors that have been occurring for a while. And if we would have read Mark Gurman's report, half of the things that we picked would not have been in the draft. And I would say the um, there was still some mystery, but I would say if we had done um, uh, eight picks instead of four, it we would have gotten a winner right because we would have been forced to pick more esoteric things and yes. some of those would have hit and missed but yeah. we, it was a mini draft and so we didn't and then the big moment and I, I actually thought about it about a minute after i made my selection is you picked a 13 inch macbook pro 
thing. Yep. And I thought to myself, oh, geez, I think there will be a 13. And so I picked also a 13-inch MacBook Pro thing. We, in fact, got somebody on Mastodon who was like, that doesn't seem fair to Jason. It's like, look, I did it to myself. Yep. But I, I, wanted, I decided that I was going to try to block you and that if you got a point for the 13-inch MacBook Pro, I was going to too. And uh, like a minute later, I'm like, why did I do that? I, I, I'm not sure there's going to be a 13-inch MacBook Pro, but it was too late. We were very and that excited was, about that it. was a fatal error. Yeah, be, uh, my bathroom, my, mm-hmm. my shower thoughts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Things you think of in the shower. Well, I thought look, the hey, next day in the shower gonna, that was a bad idea. We'll, we'll talk about it, but I actually think we, you were on the right lines, but just in a, in a they, way they that were seemed more bold. unrealistic. Yes. So, yeah, they were more bold than I expected. Draft results were as follows. Jason scored two points for the 24-inch iMac introduced and 14 and 16-inch MacBook Pro models introduced. Uh, the There was no 13-inch MacBook Pro, so the no longer has touch, touch bar on MagSafe. There is no product anymore. Um, there is an element of a way that pick could have been written that could have been correct, right? If you've yeah. just been like the entry-level MacBook Pro. MacBook Pro. Now yeah, we're getting whatever. into Ricky's territory. With it's wording. ridiculous, yeah. Uh, and Apple Mouse redesigned to not charge on the bottom. That did not happen. Huh. Um, I scored for the thing I was least com- com- like confident about, which was M3 processor announced, oh, uh, which in, in hindsight is I very re- funny. I really wish you had taken my offer of you get no M3 and I get M3, but you you were too you were too afraid to do that. Oh, I I because I I would wouldn't have taken the no even though I wasn't yeah, sure about it. I know. It. I know. Um, I did not score for peripherals updated of USB C. Nope. I did not score for a new 13 inch MacBook Pro. I did score for the IMAX have the same colors. I was frantically yeah. checking that while the video was occurring. Yeah. Uh, last night, neither of us scored picks for our game demo or creative pre- professional testimonials. Nope. Um, there were like elements of these things, but not in the ways in which we had picked for them. Like they showed games, but they didn't have like yep. a person from a game Correct. studio. And they had like talking ad about where people were showing, like using these things, but they were actors, I think yeah, in a lot not, of instances. That, that's not, that um, doesn't count. And so and, we ended up and, tied yeah, and, and the uh, and the tiebreaker was I said it a little too low. I, I it, mm-hmm. the the event was just just a few seconds, I believe, over thirty minutes long. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if I had said it at thirty, which was my initial thought, um, uh, you still would have gotten it. But I said it even lower than that, so I would have had to set it at thirty one for you to, and you still would have taken the over, and I would have won. But it's fine. It's a, a you know a lot of our draft results, if you look back, have been ties, <laughs> an awful lot of them. So that's why we have the tiebreaker. That's why we have to have the tiebreaker. Anyway, so congratulations again. This year is my crushing sweep, victory. Full sweep continues for Mike. Yeah. So this is mm-hmm. this has been the year of Mike over yep. here when it comes to Indeed. the draft. Yeah, that turns out that was your annual theme. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the year of the draft. Who could have known? Mm-hmm. Uh, I wanted to do some kind of like bigger thoughts uh, about the event itself. Um, I kind of alluded to it a little bit in my weird opening. I yeah. I. I feel like they're, the re- the result of the question of why are they doing this in the evening was not answered, which I think was the most likely thing. Uh, there was no reason, it seemed Halloween. like. Halloween. But even then, like th- they didn't need to do the Halloween theme because they kind of didn't really lean into it enough, in my opinion. Like yeah. It was at night, there were bats, and yeah. Johnny Suruji said, welcome to my lab. Like Outside uh-huh. of that, it I feel like if you're going to do this, do it. And I don't really feel like they did. I know that like when Tim was walking, there was a werewolf sound. I was like, oh, excellent. And then it was just Tim Cook. And he was just yeah. excited to say good evening, which he also didn't do in a voice. You know, it's just like, if you're going to do it, do it. Otherwise, don't good ruin evening. everybody's schedules. You know, I don't know. I don't know. I I have I had thought that maybe we would understand it all in the cold light of day today. It didn't happen. No, it didn't so, happen. I mean, they. I think the answer is that they somebody sold them on Halloween theme, and they said okay, and then they put it into their regular content engine, and all the Halloweeniness got almost all of it got ironed back uh, out. Yes, that there were presenters like every presenter had a costume, you know, and then they're like, right. no, I'm not wearing this. Nope. And then by the end of it, all we ended up with was it happens at night. And, like, the idea, like, you know, some people are saying in the Discord, pro stuff happens at night, but they do this for the iPhone, too. Like, the they iMac. just turn all the lights off, right? And they have Greg Joswiak stand outside at night. 
Um, it doesn't right. need to be at night. And so I just want to petition. I don't want that to happen again, but you That's know. my theory about yeah. Jaws is Jaws just works the night shift. That's he all. does. Someone He's has like, to. You know, Tim, Tim signs out and Jaws signs in and they, they meet in the, in the lobby of Cafe Max and, mm -hmm. And uh, and Tim says evening Jaws, and Jaws says evening Tim, and then they pass, and then and then uh, Jaws is in charge at night. So while I night don't workers. agree with the evening event, I do agree with this being an event. I was seeing a lot of people on Mastodon, especially, being like, "Oh, yeah. what was the point of it?" Like this felt like something to me. The whole thing. We're going to talk about all of it, obviously. Worthy of there being a video. I. I don't understand people sometimes, Mike. I mean, I, I think the truth is that people have unreasonable expectations and they and they they complain that uh, things aren't events. They complain that things are events. They complain that events are too long and boring and padding padded. They complain that events are too short and mm. too packed with information and not long enough. People don't know what they want. I'll tell you this. Apple introduced its entire M3 chip architecture. That's not a press release. That's it. That's all you need to know. They and, and if you're thinking about like the products, okay, MacBook Pro, super important product in certain product categories. But if you don't want to think about that, and the iMac is nice, sure, think of it this way. Those products are the vessels <laughs> used to launch M3, M3 Pro, M3 Max. And that's what this event was about. And that's super important to Apple. It sets the stage for the next year plus of the Mac which is also very important. Let them brag. Let them boast about their three nanometer process. There's a lot of stuff going on here. That's why this event exists. Um, it's not. It's not a hard one at all. Like I did. I did at one point. I think I did. I put this in my story. Uh, at one point, uh, the phrase came out that was, uh, "It's the M3 Pro with MacBook Pro." Yeah, that was in your conclusion. <laughs> yeah, like, you, you kind of and like mentioned that. It's not. It's not quite right, but yet it is kind of what this is, right? It's like this is actually it's the chips with a computer attached because that's, again, in the end, they're launching products. But what they're really doing is launching their whole Mac uh, chip line. And that's worth a that's worth an event. Bottom line. It was, I'm just absolutely going to double back on something I meant to mention a second ago. Um which in regards to the gaming, when we're talking about the draft, this is just a complete aside. Um I was very surprised and kind of pleased with the fact that the game that they did choose to feature was Baldur's Gate 3, which is one of the like game of the year contenders this year. Mm. And it's just super surprising. And maybe this is a sign of the times that a current game of the year contender is running on a Mac. Like I, I've been playing it on my MacBook air. Now it's nowhere near as good as when I play it on my gaming PC, but it runs and like it would run even better on these new M3 machines, obviously, especially on the bigger ones with the bigger graphics chips. And I, I genuinely hope that this is the start of that. And also, as James is pointing out, it's not in the app store. This is on Steam. So like the way you get Baldur's Gate three is you get, need to get Steam first. And so I just thought that that was. It, it, we're, I'm always looking for these signs that Apple is paying attention to gaming. And the fact that they chose Baldur's Gate 3 and not Resident Evil again, as especially because Resident Evil came out yesterday on the iPhone, right? So, like, the fact that they chose to show Baldur's Gate, that is a good sign for me of, like, they're paying attention. So, just a random aside on gaming that I wanted to mention there in case we don't come up to, with it again. All right. But I agree with you. People, I think that the issue with this stuff is, like, the people that are complaining are probably not the same people all the time, so you just got the each camp complaining. But I just think this was the right way to do it. They spent time talking about it. Press release wouldn't have given it the justice. Just go for it. Mm -hmm. Last thing I wanted to mention, I spotted this at the end and then uh, didn't really think much of it and then saw a lot of people talking about it, that the event was shot on an iPhone and edited yep. on a Mac. And I found a couple of posts on threads, one from Tyler Stallman and then a couple from Halide, where I'm assuming that Apple PR gave these creators and developers imagery that shows how they produced the, uh, the yes. event. And it is awesome and hilarious to look at the, the size of the equipment that these iPhones were put into, like these yeah. huge camera arms and rigs and all this yeah. lighting and stuff. It, it is, it's very mm -hmm. funny. But I think that this is kind of incredible that they did it, even though they did it right. to the, like, with all of the help that they had. The fact that they could 
shoot that event on an iPhone and you would not have noticed. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I think that's great. And the point is, look, the point is not, hey, everybody, uh, you can just hold an iPhone. Like, of course, they're using professional everything. And of course, there's a lot of CGI going on here, too. Uh, But the point is that they're using the image capturing itself is on the iPhone, and that is good enough to generate that output. That's the point. And uh, yeah, good for them. Also, one of the shots from the Halide uh, thing, which everybody sent to me in the Discord, apparently there was a video that now has disappeared where this stuff came from, which is really Ah. weird and interesting. Like it was on Apple's YouTube channel, but not anymore. I don't know why they did that. But there's a shot of like from behind Tim Cook showing the crew, there is so many people, (laughs) so many people there. There must be like 50 people, 60 people, maybe more that you can kind of make out in the, in like the, I don't know what you'd call it. Like watching Tim Cook do the thing. Like, I guess this is from people from all over the place. Mm -hmm. Kind of fascinating. Tim Cook stand up. Yeah. Well, I don't know if you've seen it because it's a, it's a, in sports in America, but there's the, uh, Apple ad with the um, Olivia Rodrigo video okay. that is shot on iPhone 15. Um, and it's the same thing with the same kind of rigs. And it's like, yes. it's I, I believe it's her real video, but the version of it that's in the Apple ad also shows them shooting it using these similar kind of rigs in an iPhone 15. And this is clearly part of their marketing message is, you know, the iPhone 15, again, yeah, you can use it to shoot a music video or a, an Apple thing. But the point is, that even like this level of professional video, you can't tell that it was shot on an iPhone because the iPhone video is that good at this point. That, that's the point. I hope that this this little behind the scenes video pops up uh, again because I, I would like to see more about it. I just think it's kind of cool that they did that. This episode is brought to you by Ladder. Let's be real, we all have a tendency to put things off until the last minute. Whether that's going to the DMV, arranging a dental checkup, getting to that home improvement project, I have a list of these things that maybe will go on forever. Most of the time it works out to just delay this stuff. But the one thing in life that you cannot afford to wait on is setting up term coverage life insurance. And there's a bunch of reasons why this is important. You've probably seen life insurance commercials and thought to yourself, I'll look into that later on, but this isn't something you should wait on. Choose life insurance through Ladder today. Listen to me as I say this to you. Stop waiting around. Ladder is 100% digital. No doctors, no needles, no paperwork. When you apply for $3 million in coverage or less, you just answer a few questions about your health in an easy-to-use application. Ladder's customers rate them 4.8 out of 5 stars on Trustpilot, and they made Forbes Best Life Insurance list in 2021. All you'll need is a few minutes and a phone or laptop to apply. Ladder has smart algorithms that work in real time to find out if you're instantly approved. There are no hidden fees. You can cancel at any time, and you'll get a full refund if you change your mind in the first 30 days. Ladder policies are issued by insurers with long, proven histories of claims, paying claims. They're rated A and A+, by AM Best. And since life insurance costs more as you age, now's the time to cross it off your list. This is the important part. Every day, you're getting older, and every day, it will get more expensive. So go to ladderlife.com slash upgrade today to see if you're instantly approved. That is L-A-D-D-E-R life.com slash upgrade. One last time, ladderlife.com slash upgrade. Our thanks to Ladder for their support of this show and Relay FM. So let's start by talking about the M3 family of chips. Uh, Apple will use the word family a lot in the press releases and stuff like that. So I think that's like a good way to talk about them. Sure. Um, the majority of the family introduced at once. I guess all that is left would be the ultra chip, right? As- Which is probably just two Maxes connected. So yeah. fundamentally, not really a new chip, just a new, I don't know, coll- collection of a pair of chips, <laughs> but it's too, It's it going to be two existing M3 Maxes, almost certainly. Uh, do you have any kind of feeling about why you think they chose to do it this way? Here's the whole thing. Here's all the M3. Uh, it's a good question. I think that from a, from a marketing standpoint, I think it's actually stronger to go out with your whole line than to go out with your weakest product, right? Like, we've reached the point now where you can impress. Like, the M1 impressed us, but, you know, the Pro and the Max are where you really see them at their best. 
and at this point you come out with the m3 and we're all going to be like okay with the pro and max but i think that so i think there's a marketing argument here but i think the truth is they were all ready at the same time i think the truth is they were all going into production on this new three nanometer process and are all available now and so they're going to launch them now I, I, I do think it comes down to that, that they're ready yep. now, and so they're going to launch them now. And and seriously, like, I'm I'm sure that they're deciding what products they go in based on the volumes that they can manage. I think that the reason that it's a, it's an iMac and a low-end MacBook Pro and not a MacBook Air is that the MacBook Air sells a lot of volume. Although the low-end MacBook Pro may be too, but the way they've done it, and we'll get to that, may will move the volume around and won't be like the old 13-inch MacBook Pro, which mm-hmm. was their second best-selling computer. So um, I, I think they chose these vessels <laughs> uh, carefully in a way. Like the iMac, it was it, it had gone a long time before since an update, so why not? And then on the MacBook Pro side, clearly their strategy is to use all three. This is the first time that um, Apple has sold what we will call one computer that comes in different configurations using all three of the Apple Silicon chips. Yeah. No computer has had that before. Interesting. Uh, but to do that and have that strategy, you, you kind of need to have all of them come out at once. So I think it just, I think it worked out this way and it probably has something to do with chip production that they were all available now rather than them, you know, sort of like, oh, finally we got the M3 off the assembly line and we can get to the M3 Pro. I don't think that was how it worked this time. Yeah. I will say I personally... I think I I like this strategy of of doing it in one go rather than the way they've done it previously where it's like here's the, the M3 out. and it's going to go in this and then you know just from like our perspective of like <laughs> just working out what the ramifications are for any of these product releases I think it is and it will be more helpful and interesting to see reviews and benchmarks of all of them at the same time rather than like we get the M3 and then we have to try and extrapolate what we think that might mean for the M3 right. Pro a little later on yeah. down the line. I'm happy that we will see the entire line all in one go. I also just think from a product release standpoint, it I think that there is just, a, it makes sense to do this, to have multiple products at once that are receiving these these chips. I also really do like the idea that, and this, I hope that we'll see more of this in the future, way more flexibility for what chip can go inside of a machine, right? Like that 14-inch MacBook Pro Uh is very versatile. It's the most versatile machine that Apple has shipped under Apple Silicon, right? That like it can house all three, which when it comes down to it are vastly different from each other from a power perspective. And this one machine has been designed and built to be able to fit from the lowest to the nearly highest end right i would love one day for there to be a laptop that will take all four like that would be cool right they do a macbook pro that could take an ultra but i don't know if they would ever do that maybe that would just be kind of fun (laughs) do you think that this is likely to occur again in the future that they would do it this way i mean i do hope so but do do you think it's possible yeah I think it's going to come down to production and details of production, but I think yeah. that this is the way I think they would prefer to do it is do an unveiling of the new chip family. And and we'll just have to see how it that goes. It tells a better right? story, because I think. From, it does, from but, but again, if you're in a situation where you have the M4 and the M4 Pro and the M4 Max are not going to be ready, it, they're not going to, I think they're not going to stop and not introduce an M4 or Mac, right? Like yeah. I, I think that they will still do it, but I I, I, this feels like a a better approach because it lets them tell the whole story at once. So these are three nanometer chips. There mm-hmm. was a lot of question. We were getting quite a lot of follow up and and people writing into us because we were assuming it was going to be three nanometers, where they were saying, "Oh, but it we based on the previous the A16 chip, mm-hmm. not the A17 chip." Well. Hi, it was three nanometers. Yeah, here's what you need to know is the A series is on an annual cycle and the M series is on an 18 month cycle and we're in number three. So your choice is either to go back a year or or you have now synced up again to the fourth chip. And so I think that's exactly what we've gotten is M1 was A14, M2 was A15, M3 is A17, A16, forget about it. To me, it just seemed pretty simple. The fact that they said the words three nanometer when they introduced the iPhone, to me, just said that was what it was going to be for the Mac. 
Like yeah. I, it wasn't necessary to talk about three nanometers with the iPhone. Like it kind of just wasn't. And I feel like you, you wouldn't, I wouldn't, if I was them, want to talk about that so specifically and then can't put it in my computers. It's also just boasting. I mean, yeah. and, and it's 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 bragging, right? We're like, we're the first, they said we're the first three nanometer chip in a phone and now it's we're first three nanometer chip in a computer. That's that They get to brag about that because they've got their deal with TSMC and they feel like they are out on the cutting edge of chip design for these devices. And, you know, you, you got to brag about that. That's good. That's good uh, marketing. So the three nanometer process allows for them to get more speed increases. Um, I'm really intrigued about how this continues over time because they keep making these chips faster. But like, is that something you can keep doing forever? Like, I I, I wonder when they're going to start to hit some walls of that, but they haven't this time. So I'm going to give you some info here. Apple is saying that the okay. efficiency cores on the M3 family of chips is 50% faster than the M1 and 30% faster than the M2. The performance yep. cores are 30% faster than the M1 and 15% faster than the M2. And the neural engine is 60% faster than the M1 and 15% faster than the M2. And as you put in your yep. article, the proof will come in the testing, not the press releases. Those are stats from the press release. But basically, that doesn't really tell you too much about what it's going to do for your work load or your use case just to say that like the capability is there in these machines to be faster right i think a 15 percent increment over generation is pretty reasonable and that yep. seems to be what they've gone here this is um and they're comparing it to m1 which adds some confusion but at the same time because it's like right as somebody chronicling sort of like what uh, change in the apple chips you want to detail it based on um like the last generation but the truth is that in terms of upgrades people are coming more likely coming from m1 and intel and yep. um and so you want to do those comparisons but it also makes bigger numbers which makes apple feel better whereas we are all kind of focused on m2 just because that tells a different not not for the purpose of upgraders of products but for the purpose of kind of telling the story of mm -hmm. how this chip family progresses over the previous one so we'll we'll have to see remember these are things. all up to whatever percent faster and what is that you know up to means it's from what zero or slower to faster like yep. it and it will entirely depend on um seeing these in in you know real context and not in apples apples I, i've said this before i'll say it again uh apple's performance marketing is based on real numbers in fact the performance marketing is people i know who used to work in MacWorld. um are, they're in that group like they're real numbers but it is marketing and so they're going to pick the good numbers mm -hmm. but they're not fake numbers they're real numbers it's just that you know you're you're taking their word for it and and they're selling you something so you can't take their word for it we have to check and yeah, so like, we will we'll get the you know as a community of testing people te we'll get the numbers i think from a presentation perspective i agree that it is best for apple to talk about the m1 and intel like i don't think sure. it is that helpful for them when marketing the product is to compare it to last year for the mac because yeah I, i'd say it's when you're talking about chips i care more about last year when you're talking about products we do right well, yeah, but I'm saying any. I'm saying regular consumers don't care about chips, right? When you're marketing the product, your product claims compared sure. to older models is a stronger argument. Sure. But when you're just talking about the chips, I I, I don't accept the argument that like well, regular people because regular people don't care about the chips. No, right? I mean, and it's good that we get um, that. if they give us information, we get the information. But I I think that from a marketing perspective, it would be confusing if they gave two different sets of speed increases during the same presentation, right? Like. If they want to compare the MacBook Pro to the M1 MacBook Pro, that's going to be one set of statistics. And if they compare the M3 to the M2, it's another set of statistics. And I think it's a little bit much. But they give us the information for as much as they're going to give it, right? Like, we have the numbers, but now it's about actually putting them to the test. Sure. And what they've chosen to do with the chips is put them in the context of M1 and M2. So it's the March mm -hmm. of Apple Silicon progression. In the individual product areas, they talk about Intel. Yeah, because there you've got a, you've got a bunch of upgraders coming from Intel, and so the Intel numbers are relevant there. They didn't do that in the chip area because that's not the story they're telling. They're really just telling about the Apple Silicon chips getting faster. They leave the the Intel comparisons to the individual product categories. So the GPU also got a bunch of time. Um, they've put 
more features into Apple's graphics processing pipeline. So they now have hardware accelerated mesh and ray shade. Uh, ray tracing, so mesh shading yes. and ray tracing. Um, right, both which of which was, are in the iPhone Pro yep. uh, So we chip expected too. it here. This yeah. is like an expectation that they were going to do this. But they also introduced something called dynamic caching. Uh, mm-hmm. My simplified way of explaining this is it's all about how yeah. memory is being allocated to the GPU from the system. Do yeah, you, you're simplifying something that I simplified from yeah. somebody who's very smart who told me about this that I'm not supposed to talk about because it's all on background. But okay. somebody very smart who might work at Apple uh, explained to me <laughs> a little bit more about this. Anyway, so let me try to explain it again. Please. Uh, dynamic caching is, let, let, let's be honest here, dynamic caching is a marketing term that Apple has come up with to try and get explain why they're getting more GPU bandwidth uh than just what you'd expect from the 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 chip speed improvements themselves uh how do you get a a real improvement in gpu performance and efficiency um and um you know you have to be really mode since this is something that no you know according to apple anyway i mean no chip designers have done this before like this is a this is they 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 came up with this approach because they're really trying to wring as much performance out of their gpus as possible so the way it was explained to me is so so and again it's simplifying but um there are threads that are being used by the gpu to do tasks and there are a few ways that you can set up how much how many you know how much memory essentially you want to use for a particular thread of a task and there are a couple approaches you can take. So think about it that way. Think about you're doing a game or whatever, but you've got lots and lots and lots and lots of threads and you're pumping them into a GPU. Mm-hmm. Um, the way traditionally it's done is generally you either look at what the peak amount that you're going to need of memory that you're going to need for this thread is, and you set you allocate that much memory to it because you don't want to run out of memory. Um, or alternately, you set it. You're, you're like careful about the memory you use, and you set it to a specific amount. But you know that if you use it all, it is going to create a bottleneck mm-hmm. where you've used it all, and so everything is going to sort of like back up and slow down because you can't allocate more memory to that thread. The thread has to wait. That's the general idea. And if you if you think about it that way, you can. And they did their little their little uh, graphic of the with the peak. There's inefficiency. One on one side, on the on the kind of bottleneck side, you get a bottleneck. That's not great. But on the other side, you have you have memory reserved for this one thread all the time that's only used at the peak moment. And then it goes down from there and that memory is sort of sitting there allocated but unused. And if you think about a GPU and about the whole pool of memory that the that the system has on a Mac, um, and you're doing a really intensive task. Uh, one way you could be more efficient is to reclaim that space that's not being used by that thread uh, when it's not at peak. And similarly, if you've got a thread that's bottlenecked, one way to make it move better would be to give it more memory. But it's bottlenecked. So what they do is this thing, which they're calling dynamic caching, where essentially the system is looking at the threads and is dynamically adjusting how much memory is allocated to them so that in a bottleneck situation, the bottleneck can be opened and that in a situation where memory is being allocated for peak, when it's not at peak, they can take that memory back and give it to something else. And so if you can imagine a bunch of threads hitting the GPU and you know, they're all jostling, they all need memory, and you've run out of memory. Um, well, if a lot of them aren't at peak right now, you actually do have memory, if you can dynamically reassign that memory to a different thread. That is the super simplified, don't ask me any questions, version of what this is. So it's an idea where Apple's chip designers have worked really hard to squeeze out this extra memory performance in order to make the GPU performance greater. And they're real proud of it. <laughs> and again, the impression I got is you wouldn't do this and you unless you were extremely motivated to increase the efficiency of your GPU. And Apple is extremely motivated to do so. So it's an interesting idea. So with all of that, the base uh, chip still just supports one monitor. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, no, I don't know. These things are related, but it is. I know yeah. it's something that no, a lot of people uh, find. No, I mean they're they're not related at all. I, I, let me let me close the loop on the GPU thing and yeah. just say that the um the 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 big point here is that this is not an API. This is all like at the system level. Uh, developers of software don't change anything. It just happens. So yeah. it's transparent, which is great. Uh, which is why in the end it's going to come out as being GPU speed. Yep. Or efficiency, right? It, that's 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 how you're going to see it. Is you're not going to see it as like, haha, we did this thing. It's going to be more like, oh, it is faster. It is more frames per second. Things like that. Yeah. Okay. B M M3. So you, you said it. One external monitor only, just like the M1 and the M2. The, and this is a story that now goes beyond the M3 base model. Apple is with this line doing some really clear product differentiation like the m3 the m3 pro and the m3 max are all getting even more distinct from one another i think it's most interesting in the m3 pro but the m3 um so intel has given everybody the idea that low-end systems should support multiple external monitors mm -hmm. because intel built their chips that way mm -hmm. now intel built their chips that way probably because they wanted them to be sold to as many different companies for building into products as possible. And so they wanted the flexibility there. Apple has decided, and it is a decision, Apple has decided that their low-end chips don't, in order to save basically on, the, on, on money, but also to differentiate them from the other chips, that it's going to have limited capabilities for video. And it's essentially only going to be able to do two streams of video, which means that on a Mac Mini, you can run two displays. But on an iMac and presumably a MacBook Air, you can only run one external display because they've got an internal display that is wired in. Um, they It's a decision that they make. Mm -hmm. um, I, I definitely... So here's here's the hard thing. I think they should support two external displays on on an M3. I think they should, but they don't. I think they should, at the very least, they should engineer it so that if you're on a laptop in lid closed, yeah, you can run it two work. external displays, that, right? Like work, I, I get, yeah. I get not three, right? Not the idea that you have your laptop display and two external displays. But when the laptop screen is off or the lid is closed, it sure would be nice if they had built that in, and they didn't. Again, so if you're a Mac, if you want a MacBook Air but you want to run two external displays, you can't do it. And I feel for you, but at the same time, I understand what Apple is doing here. Apple is doing market segmentation. Apple is saying if you are a sophisticated enough user to require two external displays attached to your laptop, you should buy a Pro chip. Yep. That's it. That's what they're saying. Like, we're not going to make it easy for you to buy a $1,000 laptop and have two external displays because you are a sophisticated enough user that you should be giving us more money. That's what they're saying. I again, I don't I don't hate that. I understand it. That's business. What I hate is that they've made it so that even if the laptop is closed, it can't drive two. That seems silly. Um, and it's even sillier on the new, which we'll get to in a little bit, the new 14 inch MacBook Pro base model, which still has like an HDMI port on it, but can still only drive one external display, not two. <laughs> it's a little it's just it's a little bit silly i wish i wish they had done this maybe next time but I, I i wouldn't hold out too much hope because i feel like what apple's doing here is and we can say artificially but like it's business this is it apple has decided to segment their products in this way and i know that intel is doing something different um but until apple feels like oh no we're losing macbook air macbook air sales to intel or qualcomm based uh laptops uh because so many people want to do two external displays it's never going to happen. I think they'll just keep doing it. I mean, this is one of the things where I think it would be nice if they did it for the people that want it, but I do agree with, like, I feel like this is pretty niche uh, for people well, yeah. that, that want this particular computer. Like, so, if you exactly. do want to do this that badly, there are many computers that you can buy or can be provided that will do it. And if it's that important for your work and your work is not providing it, then they need to change what they're providing you. You know what? I, like, I feel like, like w yes. why can't a MacBook Pro drive 15 displays? Like, why I not, feel, right? I feel for somebody who just wants a MacBook Air but also has, you know, wants to run three displays. Yep. But, like, David in our chat just said, it's a serious choice of Apple's at this point. Three displays is pro feature and then a 
a, a smiley that's not smiling. And I think the implication that David is making there is, come on, Apple. I would say, if you're running three displays, you're a pro user. Yes. Three displays is an uncommon- a pro feature. Very, very, very uncommon use case. Yes. And I know it's your use case, so 100% of you personally <laughs> are using it that way. And you may 100% not want to buy the pro machine, but, but this but, is kind of just the way it rolls. But look, if, if Apple knew that MacBook Airs were not being sold because everybody wants to hook them up to two external displays, they would have changed it. But yeah. it's just not true. Yeah. It's just not true. And it and it is like saying, well, I want more ports. I want the newest Thunderbolt. I want the uh they're artificially withholding the HDR that XDR screen from the MacBook Air. It's like they're not artificially withholding it. It costs a lot of money. That, that MacBook Air has a very specific price point and you if you want the nicer thing, you got to pay more money for it. That's business. So there's a there's a business decision going on here. I I think it's amplified by the fact that Intel made everybody believe that that was a table stakes feature. And so it was in Apple's laptops when they were on Intel. Apple clearly doesn't think it is and is saving. I will also say this. Apple is saving money in the design of the low end chip by not having it be capable of more external displays. It's saving Mm -hmm. money. It is cutting corners there because that is, and I know it's not fun to hear this, the budget chip. That's what it is. It's a budget chip. I know it's Apple, so budget is bigger than it would be for other computer makers, but still, it is their low end model and it's differentiated in that way. Like I said, I still think they should at the very least support two displays in in lid closed mode. I don't think that's uh, too weird. I think in lid closed mode, I understand for sure. It. Like I agree with that. I think that that just makes logical sense to me. That because it's like complicated. Because people in the Discord now are saying like, "Oh, I think this chip does this. This chip does that." No, it's actually very complicated. Like M3 supports one external display. That means two total displays. M3 Pro is two external displays in some resolutions and one external display in other resolutions, but that can mean a total of three total displays. The Mm -hmm. M3 Max can support four external displays. And then again, a bunch of different caveats for if different resolutions would be different amounts, but that means the M3 Max can support a total of five displays because you include the internal display because you can have the laptop open. Very confusing, but... Would be better if that M3 could do two always, right? Like they always could be open or closed, all of them, right? And that either grants you the ability to use it open or to use it closed and have a display take its place. That would be good if they did yeah. that. So I, I get people saying, "Well, but I wish that the thing that I bought for less did more." <laughs> I get it, but uh, and, and and like I I I totally do get it. But I, you know, the fact is that also I have to say this is Apple segmenting their their market, and 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 there's you know talk in our our Discord now about like, oh, in corporate life, two mediocre displays is a very common thing, and mm-hmm. it's like okay, two me- two mediocre displays hooked up to a Mac is a very common thing. Well, if that's true, I think in corporate life, I think what Apple would probably say is, hey, corporation. If that's your setup, you need to you need to give us more money. If that's if that's the way yeah. you're doing it, give us more money, right? Because in the end, that's what they're saying is is what people are saying is I wish they made this thing more capable than it is. And like I get your I get your wish, but I'm also trying to understand what Apple's doing here, which is saying no, pay us, <laughs> right? That's that's they look. We talk about like rounding up <laughs> and then going up higher with Apple stuff. Like Apple makes a lot of money and it has huge profit margins, and this is one of the reasons why is they are not going to, they're going to differentiate their products and the cheapest product is not going to be the most capable. It's just not. I want to run through some some stats. Yes, okay. Some statistics for okay. you, if you don't mind, about the different chips. All right, so the M3 still has an 8-core CPU, which is the same as the M2. It has four performance, four efficiency. This is the same. Maximum of 10 GPU cores and a maximum of 24 gigabytes of RAM. The M3 Pro still has a 12 core CPU, but it is now 6 performance, 6 efficiency, shifting from 8 and 4 in the M2. Has a maximum of 18 GPU cores, which is down 1. And a maximum of 36 gigabytes of RAM, up from 32 gigabytes of RAM. And I've been seeing a lot of people 
very upset about that number, 36, that it doesn't make sense to them, which is interesting. The M3 Max <laughs> has a 16-core CPU. That is 12 performance, 4 efficiency, up from 8 and 4. The maximum GPU spec is 40 cores, up from 38. The maximum RAM is 128 gigabytes, up from 96 gigabytes. Mm-hmm. So a bunch of numbers. <laughs> thank you for the numbers. No problem. It's, uh, more effective in a chart, but this is a podcast, and so you get a Can't verbal do chart. It's a, it's, a, it's, a it's a verbal chart. It's a verbal chart. You got to draw yeah, it in it your brain. It is. Um, so here's what's going on. So M3 low end didn't change it right. It's like on the new architecture, but pretty much the same idea for performance, for efficiency. Now we should we should note, and Apple has talked about this. It's true. Apple's efficiency cores are pretty fast, right? Like the idea here is that is that you're doing your day to day life. You may never even need the performance cores until you really tax your computer. And the efficiency cores are super power efficient, so they're the ones that give you the great battery life. Um, but it, it's a very familiar setup. It's pretty much the M2. Like we talked about the displays and all of that, right? Like they made the decision to really not do a lot to the base model. They're kind of keeping it where it is, just on this new you know, three nanometer process and it's the new cores and it's the new neural engine and it's faster in all those ways, right? That according to Apple. But it's not a rethink of what uh, an M3 should be. It's it it is what we know. The max is to go jump up to the max. The max is really interesting because they are putting their I would say foot to the floor <laughs> on the high end. They're like, no no no, here we go. Eight efficiency eight performance cores, how about twelve? That's what they did. They, the same number of efficiencies, four, but they went from eight to 12. So huge CPU boost there. This is why it's going to be so much faster than an M1 Max, right? Like it is my poor little M1 Max in my Mac Studio. Um, they increased the GPU cores a little bit. They increased the max RAM, which is going to make a lot of people happy to go 128. They, they did a bunch of stuff. And as we know, the GPU cores are also, they should all be a lot faster. And so that's going to be a big boost. Now, also keep in mind, that's the maximum of the pro of the of the max chip uh you have to pay a lot of money to get up there there are going to be other configurations with fewer cores on gpu and cpu that's how the, and, and of course you know you have to pay a lot of money for that much ram that's apple but uh the the edges of of high performance are there and they're further out than they used to be especially those 12 performance cores that's going to be like a cpu monster okay this leaves us with the pro chip and i think and it, I knew, uh, we've learned a little bit more since my briefing. Because my briefing, you know, I get what Apple gives me, but I don't get anything else. I don't have the website. I'm not digging through all the details. I have the press release, and I have what they told me. Um, but even with that, I started to have an inkling while I was talking to them that something's going on with the M3 Pro. Like, the M3 Pro used to feel like a ba like a baby brother of the M3 or the M2 Pro and the M1 Pro felt like they were like lesser maxes, <laughs> right? <laughs> and this doesn't this is this feels like it is detached entirely from the Max and is drifting toward the M3 in the sense that I think Apple is doing some more they're more confident with Apple Silicon they're doing more chip differentiation. And the M3 Max, and the way they position it in their marketing, and you, if you pay attention to that event, you saw it. The, it's like the M3 Max is for the highest, most demanding professional user. And they, they're coming up with like new ways of describing the kind of work that goes into it, and medical imaging and all this stuff. And they're, they're like, when, when you speak, hear Apple speak in the context of the M3 Max, they are talking about the most demanding users. I think they're doing that for a reason, which is that they have put their foot to the floor in terms of performance, but that's going to be a really expensive chip. And they anticipate that most people are going to use the pro chip or, or the base chip. But like those are the ones that are going to get used is the pro and the, and the base chip, not the max. And so what have they done with the pro? It feels to me like what they've done with the pro is make it more affordable or more profitable or some combination thereof it feels like it's not it you know the foot is not on the floor with the pro the pro is sort of like it's not even hanging where it was it's sort of like mm -hmm. drifting back a little bit away from the max toward the m3 and the best example of this is it only has six performance cores instead of eight 
which means that although I'm sure it will be faster than the M2 Pro, going down to trading two performance cores for two efficiency cores all else being equal it would be a slower chip i'm sure it's gonna not be because of it because it's m3 but like that's a move that they made and that is, that is a move to make it more efficient and less performative bottom line than an m theory you know than a theoretical m3 pro that had eight and four um G the gpu core is a weird one right 19 18 whatever um max ram is up that's good the memory bandwidth is down which is really interesting also by the way the um the max 36 gigs of ram is divisible by three apparently there are three ram banks instead of two so it's 12 12 12 and we're used to having two <laughs> Uh, but now it's three, so your math changes. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I am fascinated by the M3 Pro because I it feels to me like what Apple is doing is like trying to position it in a way where they've got a a powerful chip that's going to appeal to most pros except those on the highest end, and in doing so, they've like changed the mixture a little bit to make it more again so it can hit a price point and and you can say is that to make it cheaper or is that to make apple have a bigger profit margin my guess is it's a little of both which is why i would say to hit a price point that they think this is also probably uh this one is going to ship in way more volume than the max and so it's uh there's probably something about that too that like this is a thing they can make in volume maybe and the max is a little more special and specialized and then and and expensive so i just think it's fascinating i don't think it's necessarily fundamentally good or bad but you know now before i i, I used to think of that apple had a low-end chip and uh, some different flavors of high-end chip and now i think apple has a low chip a mid-range chip and a high-end chip and and that is because pro the pro chip is not to me it doesn't feel like it did before and I wonder if this goes back to what we were talking about a minute ago with the external displays, which is like we can cast our eye on these things as much as we like and try and understand what they are, what they're, who they're meant for, what they do, what the decisions are. Apple does have way more data and information than we could ever yes. imagine. Yes, they know. And this may be that like we want to create the chip that most people buying this product maybe right. are going to buy, and we think that it should be more balanced that like they're like most yeah. people are doing most of their work on the macbook pro which i reckon is the case on the pro chips right like you were saying they are yes. using the efficiency cores for like 90 percent of their work so let's have more of those yeah. or, or, to or more when they evenly when balance the load right or when they're peaking you know they're not they're not i, I would they're I, not, I don't need I would, eight. Come, I I would come at this as also as a different level which is they know what people are buying yeah, And they look at this and they think, okay, think of it this way. Let's say, and I'm just making this up, but let's say that the M2 Pro chip costs um, 10 quatlus <laughs> and the M2 Max chip costs 15 quatlus to manufacture. Mm -hmm. And they look at it and they say, oh my God, everybody buys the M2 Pro chip. But we have these customers who desperately want maximum performance, and we have to have a high-end chip for them. And it's the basis of the Ultra, which is in our Mac Pro, and we have to have the high-end chip for them. So we can't skimp on our high-end chip. But most people don't want the high-end chip. They want this Pro. And then you end up with a decision that looks like is what they made here, which is, okay, here's what we're going to do. The M3 Max is going to cost 20 quatlus. And the M3 Pro, we're going to keep it 10, or we're going to make it 8 or 7. And then we're going to we're gonna keep our prices the same, and we're going to make more money on those. But whatever it is, uh, sorry, it's quite loose. It's a Star Trek thing. Anyway. I, I will um, say, you know how you we were, we were kind of poking fun at me earlier for the amount of numbers that I said? Yeah. You made that so much more complicated for me I just by, not using, quite loose. by instead okay. of just saying dollars. Well, but it isn't ten dollars. It doesn't. Yeah, cost but $10. it also is not ten quatlus, Jason. I can confirm. It is. That to you, you don't know the well. quatlu to dollar exchange rate, Mike. Uh -huh. Fight me. Yeah, but okay. Just... <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> so this is my this is my point. Is Apple's in a position where I think they analyzed the sales of the of their products in the in the early in these days of Apple Silicon and said, ah, uh, this is what we need to do. We need to take the Max chip and make it continue to make it super awesome. And it's mm -hmm. going to be expensive, but the people who want it are going to pay for it. Yep. But this Pro chip, 
mm, right? Like, it's very popular, but they don't really need all the stuff that's in the Macs. So we got to let's back it off a little bit because that will allow us to either hold the ch- the prices the same yep. or you know or whatever maintain our margins make more of them whatever it is and that seems to be what's going on here. I just think it's really interesting cuz like I said my impression of the first couple generations was more that the Pro was just sort of a lesser max and that is not what's happening now. Like the Pro is 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 a mid-range chip that I think is powerful enough for most pros to be very happy with it and the max is becoming um, like you got to be the most, like they said, the most demanding users will pay up and get the max. And then you're buying, then you're not buying a $2,000 laptop, right? Then you're buying a $4,000 laptop. And that's the difference. It's, we, we say that these are MacBook Pros and they're all the same, but the truth is like the, the $2,000 laptop is a pro chip. And the, the, when you get to the max chip, you are now a three or $4,000 laptop. It's a very different proposition that the people who, for whom it's, it's worth spending that extra money, they'll do it. But a lot of people, most people will be like, you know, that pro chip is just fine. Yeah. <laughs> and in a laptop, like you said, more efficiency cores, very powerful, but also perhaps will not burn through the battery mm-hmm. as much. Uh, some real-time follow-up. Apple has now made public, again, the behind-the-scenes shot on iPhone video. So that will be in the show notes. I will also now just note, if you are one of the helpful listeners who have sent this to us between the beginning and this part of the episode, I would like to say thank you. And now you know why I didn't say thank you to you when you sent it to me. Ah, uh, Because nice. I'm just convinced that people will be sending it to us, having heard the first part of the show, right? And then we get to this part, but now they know that we know, and we've got it in, and I've got it in my watch later queue on YouTube now. I'm looking forward to watching it later on. This episode is brought to you by Delete Me. Everyone wants to keep their personal information private, right? It's actually personal private information. You want to keep it that way. That's why it could be uncomfortable to think about the fact that data brokers who make their businesses selling people's data, that they are out there, and that they are could be selling your data. The good news is you do have the right to stay private and protect your privacy. All you have to do is contact all of the data brokers that might have your information to check whether you're on their system and submit requests to be removed if you are. Now, listen, I don't know about you. I do not have the time to discover, hunt, and contact all of these various data brokers that may or may not be selling my information. And this is where Delete Me comes in because simply they do it all for you. Delete Me helps you purge your personal information that has been captured by data brokers, like your name, your address, your age, your phone numbers, your email addresses, by removing them from the source. You submit the information you'd like them to search for and they will do the rest. I was incredibly impressed by how simple this process was. I just gave Delete Me a bunch of information. They went out and found, in my opinion, way too many data brokers that have this information about me. They gave me a report which is super clear in showing what information that they, uh, what each, so Delete Me produced a report to show me what each broker what information they actually had about me and which stages of the removal processes they were i also was very impressed there was one that i actually didn't want to be removed from it was like an online database that was public that i wanted to stay in and i just spoke to one of the team at delete me like yep no problem we can reverse that very great very simple experience and is i'm sure going to make a huge difference in my online privacy and also how i feel about that you can get 20% off your Delete Me plan when you go to joindeleteme.com slash upgrade20 and use the code upgrade20. That is 20% off. The only way you can get it is to go to joindeleteme.com slash upgrade20 and enter the promo code upgrade20 at checkout. That is J-O-I-N-D-E-L-E-T-E-M-E dot com slash upgrade20 promo code upgrade20 our thanks to delete me for their support of this show and relay fm let's talk about the actual macintoshes in a little bit more detail than just what the chips are that go inside them i know now that we've done the chips we can now do 
This is very Apple, right? It's like, hey, yeah. chips, chips, chips. Awesome. We structure it this way, same as them. It makes Products. sense. Mm-hmm. So we did get the same year revision of the 14 and 16 inch MacBook Pro, right? They were revised to the yep. M2 in January and then in October. Yep. Here's the M3 versions. So they're late. I mean, th- th- more and more now it's very clear because we thought that at the time that they were late. They were supposed to be in the fall and they didn't come until January. January, an unusual time for Apple to release products, by the way. Uh, well, here we are. They they seem to be on an annual schedule. <laughs> yeah, the M ones were in October, right? Like we spoke about this yeah. in last on I think on the draft or maybe in last week's episode. Like the original M one were in October, and then this was January, and now we're back to October again, which would suggest yeah. that ideally next October will be the next. Hey, maybe they'll do yep. it in January, Jason. You know. Well, it, it's if they have got an M4, but <laughs> in this case, they didn't get that. I think clearly the M2 Pro chip wasn't ready until January, and now yeah. here we are with the M3 Pro chip. So that that generation got laggy at mm-hmm. the very least. So here we are, they in, in the same calendar year, um, and they are um, largely the same, it's right? Like the there same. are some changes with the one particular thing that we're going to talk about mm-hmm. about the the low end model, but. Uh, they're, they are basically, they already redesigned them, that, that display, the curved edges, the whole thing, um, they are what you think they are with Mm -hmm. a new chip in them. And as Apple said, they have a new color for pros that is unmistakably pro and they're Uh starting to show it off and I'm like, oh, it will be like the titanium color, right? Because that's what makes it like unmistakably pro because... We just did all of this, right, with the uh-uh. iPhone. No, it's space black. Space black. Space black. A quote from Jason Snell of SixColors.com. A new Written color that features a new anodization <laughs> seal process designed to reduce the visibility of fingerprints. I got my greasy monkey paws on a space black laptop and can report that Apple's as good as its word in the sense that it seems generally more resistant to fingerprints than other smudges. But I don't want to exaggerate this feature. You can still see fingerprints. They just aren't as prominent. This is a progressive improvement over something like a midnight M2 MacBook Air, but it's not a cure-all. And space black is not actually as black as space. It's dark gray. Yeah, so a lot of a lot of asters here. I'll point out. By the way, it wasn't just my greasy monkey paws. It was just a little behind the scenes thing. Uh, I was with Joanna Stern from the Wall Street Journal, and mm-hmm. she and I both pawed it as much as we could. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's you know, it, I'd love to say, oh, I pawed that thing, and uh, you couldn't see the fingerprints. You could see fingerprints on it. They were less visible, and it was harder to leave them. My understanding is that they've done something chemical in the pr- sealing process of the anodization that is creating something that is more repellent to liquids, including oil. And the idea there is it's harder for things to stick, which means it's probably also easier for you to wipe it off. But do not, again, I just have to say it, and Apple's not claiming that it doesn't do fingerprints. Apple is claiming it is more resistant to fingerprints. It's a little bit like how Apple gradually made iPhone and iPad screens more glare resistant over time, right? Like, it's not like you can hold it with the sun behind you and not have a glare. There's still a glare there. It's just less than it was. That is what is going on here. It's less fingerprinty. I love that they're trying this, and I think it will be less fingerprinty. But it's still, it don't just don't get your hopes up that, what I'm really saying is when they come out next week and, and, and there's that story that's like, gasp, I can see fingerprints. Of course you can yeah. see fingerprints. That's not the point. The point is they tried to make some chemical changes to the anodization process to reduce fingerprints. And I think they have reduced it, but they're still there. And then as for the color, and I know it's upgrade. We love talking about color here. I saw so many people excited last night when this event came out saying, oh, black MacBook, black book. Yay, it's very exciting. I love it. We're going to get it. And you know what? You do you. But as somebody who has seen it in person, let me tell you, it's just dark gray. (laughs) It's not black. It's not it's not like the like the midnight MacBook Air is the closest thing to a black laptop Apple has made in years. This is not that close. It is darker than space gray. On the on the like last generation or the low end uh, laptops, it, it's darker than that one, but it's still just dark metallic gray. It's I not. Mean, black. I feel like I genuinely feel like if, looking at the images on Apple's website, it doesn't look black anyway. So like you can you can right. tell me if they if it looks like this, but I feel like if you just look, you can see it's dark gray. Like it's it seems pretty obvious yeah. to me. That yeah, it's dark I just gray. I, you know again, 
Space Black sends the message that it's black, and I think people got a little yeah. too excited about it. And I just want to put that warning out there. If you're expecting this to be a black laptop, it's not. It is just a darker space gray, essentially. It is space grayer. And mm-hmm. that's okay, especially if you like your laptop, the darker the better. And what could be more pro than darker gray, I yeah. guess? That says it all about Apple and color. Uh, but here we are. So so just just be be aware. Be aware. And if you want the darkest laptop possible, buy the MacBook Air uh, in midnight because it's still the darkest laptop Apple makes. And I, it, it, More fingerprinty, though, for sure. For sure. I would just like to take this brief a brief aside here to just ask, can we just put a moratorium on BlackBook? Can we just stop that? Stop it. Can everyone just stop that? Just stop it. That's all I want to say. I don't okay. like the way it sounds. It's weird. Uh, just stop it. <laughs> <laughs> just stop it. It's a black MacBook. That's what it is. We don't, we don't need to do that. I ju- that's my brief aside. And that's that. We have a new 14-inch MacBook Pro that replaces the 13-inch MacBook Pro. So the touch bar is gone by replacing that laptop completely. I, I wish I had one of those, th- you know, the New Year's like... <laughs> for the de- to celebrate the death mm-hmm. of the 13-inch with touch bar. Goodbye. 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 You notice that that wasn't in the press release. I had to ask. I said, is the 13-inch gone? And they're like, yeah, it's gone. It's gone. Gone. So this now means that there is a $300 more expensive starting point yes. for the MacBook Pro. So yes. this puts further distance between it and the MacBook Air. Mm-hmm. And I do feel like there is a warrant in its price increase because... It has everything that a 14-inch MacBook Pro has, mm, right? Everything. The, mm, well, let mm. me just... When I, it's like everything in quotes, right? Like, it has the ports, it has the design, mm, no. and it has... Mm. All right, t- go on then. If you're going to keep doing that, just tell me why I'm wrong. Sorry. It, 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 it Well, la- yesterday I thought that it had everything. It doesn't have everything. But it does have the most important feature of the MacBook Pro, which is the screen. Yeah. Liquid Retina XDR ProMotion display is amazing Mm -hmm. it's the best screen apple makes and you can get it for not two thousand dollars now for sixteen hundred dollars um it doesn't have all the ports because it's got an m3 chip and so it's missing a usb port (laughs) um okay (laughs) on the uh, dan safer from the verge noticed this today on the other side so it only has the one side so it's eight gigs of ram which is not great, but again, you're just it is the cheapest they've made this thing with the great screen and all of that. And because it's an M3 only supports the one external display and it doesn't have that extra port on the left side. Right. Okay. So it, it it because and this is the same reason, right? Which is the M3 chip like the M2 and the M1 have a limited number of lanes for Thunderbolt and USB and for display. And that's why it doesn't do the external displays, and it's why it's limited in the number of ports that it can have, just like the M1 and the M2. As a result, while it's still a 14-inch MacBook Pro, it is a big asterisk because it doesn't even have the same port configuration. It's slightly different. That all said... I wouldn't and, and call I, that a big asterisk. Like Okay, it's a little asterisk. I like, mean, it's but one, it's not... One it's USB-C not, port less. When the ports change, it's, it's a little bit different. But, like, again, I just want to... I want to disclaim all of that but i want to say i agree with you it is a real macbook pro because it's got the most important stuff yes especially the screen which i that, think that is the would mo- have been... and magsafe and magsafe yes, which, and MagSafe. which the 13 inch macbook pro also yep. didn't have uh and not a touch bar which is yep. a very important feature i think if they for would if you would have told me that they were going to do this i would have assumed they would have changed the screen right that it would not have had the ProMotion Liquid Retina well, that XDR screen. Was, that was our sh- that was our shower thought, right? Yeah. Was that it would be a 13 inch with a with a cheap screen, but it yep. would look more like the 14 inch. And they look v- very clearly. Uh, first off, the 14 inch MacBook Pro has been out for a couple of years now, um, for three years now. So um, it's come down in terms of the price that Apple the the cost of manufacture has come down. So that lets Apple lower the price a little bit, and then they put the cheaper chip in it. And like they made the decision that they could bring it down to fifteen ninety nine, but what they weren't going to do is pull out the screen. And I think that's the right decision. So it doesn't have a lot of RAM. It's missing a port. It's got the it's got the lesser chip in it. 
But you know what? It's a MacBook Pro mm -hmm. with a with an M3 chip, which will still be pretty fast for a lot of people at a at a much lower starting price, and it and it has that screen that is amazing. And like I I love this move on their part um, because first off, it's access to the to the modern MacBook Pro for under two grand, right? So it's fifteen ninety nine. You can get into a modern MacBook Pro. Up to now, it's been two grand to get into that. So that's great. You mentioned it's three hundred dollars more expensive than that thirteen inch that they took off the off the line. If I had to theorize about this, and I do, I have a podcast. They're this making is what me. we do. Yeah. Um, I think Apple doesn't expect all of those thirteen inch MacBook Pro buyers, or doesn't want all those thirteen inch MacBook Pro buyers to buy the fourteen inch. I think they would like as many of them as possible to buy the fourteen inch, right? Because I think that that's the that's a more expensive product. More money goes to Apple. It's great. But I, if I, I had to guess, I would say they expect to maybe have that. Keep in mind, second best selling Apple laptop after the thirteen inch MacBook Air. <laughs> Where do all those people go? I think a bunch of them go to the fourteen inch at fifteen ninety nine, which, while it is lesser in so many ways that we've detailed is such a better computer than that 13-inch was. Plus, it's $300 in Apple's pocket. And the rest of them, I think they hope they go to the 15 and the 13-inch Airs, especially that 15. And if they can sell some people on like, no, 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 you just get the MacBook Air, I think they would be very happy with that. Because I think the truth is that most of the people who are buying that 13-inch MacBook Pro would have been much better off with a MacBook Air. Um, but we'll see, because sometimes Apple makes these decisions and it turns out that they don't know the market and the market really resists them. And they might still have a problem here, but they must have they must feel like going up to 2000 was uh, was a bridge too far, which is mm -hmm. why they had that cheaper MacBook Pro. They must feel like 1599 is not too far. And if they lose some people, they've now got not just the 13, but that 15 inch air, which I think is a very appealing computer. And it's got a pretty good price, too. So there's lots of choices now. You can get the 15 Air. You can get the 14 Pro. You can get the 13 Air. There's a lot of stuff going on there for people to choose. But they're all good. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll just see. We'll have to see how it works. So even though this is very limited, and I think there are a lot of nerds and who are like MacBook Pro snobs who are going to be like, this is not. It's like, yeah, I know. I know it's not a MacBook Pro in certain ways. But the old one wasn't either. This one's MacBook Pro in way more ways than the old one was while still being under $2,000. So I think it's a great move on their part, even though it does mean that there's basically a, a decontented 14-inch MacBook Pro that's available. Don't worry, uh, MacBook Pro snobs. They still make all of your computers, too. Yep. They're all still available up for, for $2,000 and more. And obviously, tech podcasters, we love nothing more than an uh, Apple Tech podcast, especially, we learn nothing more than like what we consider to be a product lineup that makes sense. Clean. Kind of like, oh yes, the uh, aesthetics of yeah. a product lineup. I where, don't believe you know, in the does. four quadrant idea. Like I, I think that that idea has long since passed. Was good for then, yes. but not for now. I just like there to be. I can look at a product page, and I can see all the products, and they make sense to me. And when I look at the like all Mac, all, all Mac, like compare all Macs page or whatever, right? And I see all the laptops, I'm like, yeah, this makes sense to me that we have a 13-inch MacBook right. Air and we have a 15-inch MacBook Air and we have a 14-inch MacBook Pro and we have a 16-inch MacBook Pro and you can configure them within themselves, but like that those four laptops, just it makes sense. And the old MacBook Pro just made no sense. <laughs> made no sense. <laughs> Yeah, it was from no another sense. era. Yes. Uh, one other one other note um, that I wanted to mention is color because the the low end MacBook Pro 14, the M3 MacBook Pro 14, mm -hmm. doesn't come in space black. <gasps> Gasp! It comes in silver and, and the old space gray. I guess they had some old space gray laying around. And if you want a pro, the most pro color, you gotta you gotta spend two grand. So basically, it's like you're a fake pro, right? It's the yeah, it's the mark of shame. Yeah, you're a fake pro. You, you so just get it in silver one. because then then nobody needs to know. You're a fake pro. But if you get in space gray, you're letting you're 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 telling on yourself, I guess, or something. I it don't also know. It weird. that 14 inch MacBook Pro, as pointed out by friend of the show Dan Seafoot, uh, I saw some Mastodon. 
It starts at sixteen hundred dollars. It comes with eight gigabytes of RAM. That yep. is bad. That is bad. That is just bad. I think the iMac is the same. Like, yep. stop doing that. I, you know, I, I I would love to see more. At the same time, I think there's an argument to be made that it's well, okay, it's two things going on. There's an argument to be made that that we all overvalue RAM for a lot of regular normal people who don't care, and it's fine. Um, it's but just I, a the, lot my, of money to spend on a computer I, with I, those specs. I agree. I think that the what I would say is this is a case where Apple we Apple's having us talk about sixteen hundred dollars, and the truth is fifteen ninety nine, whatever. Um, they know that you know. I I think the argument is. Let me see if I can phrase this right. The people who are just buying the base model probably don't care about the eight gigs of RAM. And the people who do care will give Apple more money. <laughs> and yeah. I think Apple likes the way that works, right? Which is like, ah, this price gets them in the door. Oh, MacBook Pro for fifteen ninety nine. dollars Tell me more. And they say, oh, it's eight gigs of RAM. And some percentage of buyers will be like, great, whatever. And they'll buy it. And they'll probably be fine with it, honestly. Because somebody who says great, whatever, probably doesn't really uh, need more RAM, honestly. Do you really need more RAM? Some people do, but lots of people don't. Um, and the people who do care will give Apple more money at a great profit margin for Apple to upgrade the RAM. And now they're not buying a $1,600 computer anymore. Like the goal, the goal of that base is to just make that price as low as they, as they feel like they can. And that's why it's a sad amount of RAM. But I, I do think that computer nerds overestimate regular people's use of their computers. <laughs> so, but I feel for all the corporate uh, people who will get the 1599 MacBook Pro given to them, and they'll and they'll struggle with the eight gigs of RAM, and they'll Chrome. be sad. I I do feel for them. Yeah, yeah, I know. Up to 22 hours of battery life, which yeah, is which is wild. Sa- that's the same as the six, same as the 16, but uh, now it's also in the 14. That's They're claiming the key. It's the 14 now too. Yeah, because when I saw that stat in the keynote, it didn't surprise me. But then when I looked it up afterwards, was surprised that the base 14 of M3 also gets 22 hours of battery life, which yeah, I think is new. like the perfect feature for that laptop. Because what they're saying is it's like on video and this is like going back to like who buy, who buys that laptop. And I think it's like a lot of people that they want to buy the pro laptop. So they get the cheapest pro laptop and they're just using it for their like life right? They're not using it to make videos and they're not using it to make music. They're like, it's their laptop. So they're watching their TV shows on it and they're doing their web browsing, which is like a perfectly acceptable use of this computer. And now you Mm -hmm. get 22 hours of battery life to do it. You can use it for longer than you can stay awake, which is just kind of awesome. Yeah. So the, um, the stat, oh, first of all, also the M3 chip has support for that. Um, was it it EV1 of, the the video codec that's on like it's oh, the not yeah. H two six four, um that that makes a difference in battery life because they do a lot of battery life. It's like video streaming AV one. Thank you, Joe Steele. Uh, in the it, it right like one of the reasons that they can have long battery life for a lot of stuff is that the chips are like not you're not using software. The hardware is doing the decoding of video formats, and that was a video format that. It, they had to software decode and now they don't. And so if, the, if you've got like Netflix movies and stuff, uh, those all hardware decode now. So you're going to actually get more battery life for stuff like that. That's how you can end up with those long battery life. I things. always like it when Apple decides to do something that actually benefits what people are doing rather than trying to get everybody to do the thing that they want them to do. You know? Right. Right. I mean, it's not their codec and they don't love it, but they realize oh, well. that people are, are streaming it. So <laughs> right? they built it into their chip. So now that it, it benefits them. the one of My favorite little bit of marketing in this whole thing is when they said that the battery life on the MacBook Pro compared, or, or let me say the MacBook Pro compared to the last Intel MacBook Pro. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They said, Battery, it's got 11 hours more battery life and it's 11 times faster. And that yeah. made me laugh. I thought so that was the pretty 11s. good. So the also, I'll, I'll use this moment to say, I know that there are a lot of people out there who are like, come on, why are they going to compare it to Intel? I roll my eyes out a little bit too. I, I had the thought of like, at some point you got to stop comparing it to Intel. But I will say, I get the impression that Apple is well aware 
that some of their products have very long um, buying cycles. Yeah. And and I know somebody <laughs> who is only now going to upgrade to Apple Silicon from an Intel MacBook, MacBook Pro, right? Like I know somebody who's a friend of mine who's like that. I know people who have old Intel iMacs. Those buying cycles are often five years, six years, seven years. And so Apple... Yes, it makes a big difference to compare it to an old Intel Mac, but I understand why they're doing it. Is they feel like there still is a big audience out there that they can speak to that says, "Hey, you can really get a better computer if you upgrade and maybe now is the time." Hey, it's 11 times faster with 11 hours more battery life. Maybe it's finally time to let go of that. There is a late just model Intel Mac. I'm seeing amount of people in the Discord right now talking about the Intel MacBook Pros that they use. So so there you go. Yep. Improving the point. Oh my God. I have multiple friends who have an Intel MacBook Everybody. Pro now, everybody's so. using Intel MacBook Pro. So this is, this is my point. Is, and, and this is like a, a, a sub note to the whole idea of what do you compare it to and comparing like a review. Like I did my iPhone review and I wrote about how it was different from the 14 and the 13 and the 12, right? Like, and the 11. Not just from the 14. Mm -hmm. Because regular people don't go in cycles like that. So while it is very beneficial to Apple to compare to old hey, Jason, Intel this isn't even regular people. This is listeners of this show. I know. I know. All right. All right. But, right? but let's also keep in mind that listeners of this show are in an elite category compared the to the rest of the yes. world. So it benefits Apple because they're comparing to an old Intel processor, not a current Intel processor. Uh, but what they're speaking to is their install base and saying, please... Uh, you know, make the move to Apple Silicon. You you need to get off of Intel. Get off of it now. And um, it's it's just it's very easy for us to poo poo it and be like Intel. Come on, old news. Comparing it to a computer from 2019. Um, but that's what they're doing, <laughs> is saying we know we still have a lot of people using computers from the 2010s, mm -hmm. <laughs> and they don't all switch every two years or three years. Sometimes it's four or five or six or seven. My family, we had an, an iMac for like seven years before we updated it. And it was like a 2011, 2010 iMac. I and mean, we had it for seven years, right? Like that's all like, Again, just perspective, I guess. Mm -hmm. Like that's one of the reasons Apple's doing it. Yes, the numbers look great, but there's also a message to be sent there saying, hey, if you're still hanging on to an Intel MacBook Pro, you should know that the best one we ever made, this is 11 times faster with essentially double the battery life. And and that's why they, they do that. They're not just doing that to boast. They're doing that because they're trying to reach people who are at toward the end of the life of their Intel Mac, trying to induce them to make the move now. And I wonder how many more versions of Mac OS will be made for Intel. I, th I still think it's going to happen for a few years. I mean, yeah. there's a lot, there's a lot of them out there and they want to keep them on se security and all of that. I, you know, I, I, I think so, but I think the new features will be very limited few. Yep. Yeah. Uh, one last thing on the MacBook Pro that I, that I thought was pretty cool is that they have increased the brightness of the display. So a yes. standard definition, it matches that of the studio display. And I just right, think at, that is at standard, great. At standard dynamic range. That's so what it I goes meant. up yes, to sorry. 600 nits yeah. now. So it's, in SD, it it's in 480p. I don't know if you yeah, call okay. that, Jason. And then it's but it's bright. <laughs> it's bright. That's all that matters, Mike. So, um, yeah, the, the idea here is... Um, you can't say that the screen is brighter because it's not brighter because it's this XDR display and it mm -hmm. does high dynamic range and it and it peak brightness it blows your eyes out and it's all great. But what they did do is most of the time you're not looking at at HDR content you're looking at standard dynamic range content, and that can now get brighter by thirty percent. So. It's actually, if you think about like you living life in standard dynamic range, these have brighter screens. Yep. Even though it's not technically true with HDR, most of us do not work in HDR. We work in SDR. And occasionally you open a photo and you're like, whoa, <laughs> or a movie. You're like, ah, the, it's so bright. Oh, no. But uh, most of the time not. So it's brighter and it matches the studio display's max brightness. So uh, that's good. It's a good thing. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I like that. I like that feature. It's just like a nice little detail. The iMac 
got an update. Yes, the iMac. N- nothing it did. really changed. It's it's the same. Same iMac. everything. It's the same colors. Same colors. The same stand. Yep. Uh, so those late rumors that we saw of some kind of stand change that didn't happen. Um, what it's done is moved to an M3. Just the M3. Yes. Just the M3. No other options. No. Nope. And in doing this, it just gains a bunch of additional features. So the maximum RAM you can put in the machine is now being cre- increased to 24 gigabytes. It gets Wi-Fi 6E and Bluetooth 5.3. These are just yeah. things that come along with the chipset, but the previous version yeah. didn't have that. It's, uh, it, it is exactly what you might expect, which is it's the M1 iMac, but now it's an M3. Which means, by the way, that all of Apple's comparisons to the M1 make sense on the iMac because there wasn't an M2 iMac. So they can just say it's twice as fast. Plus, they can say it's two and a half times as fast as the fastest 27-inch Intel Mm -hmm. iMac and four times faster than the uh, 21.5 fastest Intel iMac. So, um, and the same price and same everything else. So again, this is, I, I think those Intel iMac mentions, like I said before, are good because... I, there are a lot of Intel iMacs still in use, right? And so they just want to make it clear these are way faster. And, um, you know, the M1 iMac was still good, right? Because the M1, we keep saying this, it's a good chip. It's a real good chip for regular people. It's really good. Um, but it did need a refresh. It was time for the iMac to get some love. And I'm glad it got it. But it, it already got its big redesign. So there's nothing new here at all. They didn't even, they unless something comes out as we get them, it seems like they didn't even tweak it like at all other than mm-hmm. making the chip changes but that's yeah, no, fine it's basically nothing I, I, my feeling on the on the iMac i think skipping a chip cycle like is a good kind of product revision cycle for this product I, it's fine i think it's fine yeah. um my only disappointment here you mentioned same stand there were those rumors about a different stand attachment yep. and i don't think this is true and it's too bad like i had this I had another shower thought mike <laughs> Good, good. It please. was not a shower thought. It was actually a jog. Uh, it was a running thought. I was running. Yeah. And I had this thought, and I, I texted yeah, you it to you a, while a I was very running. Very funny iMessage, which was talking yeah, about with IMAX. The, IMA, IMAX. Which IMAX, is right? Funny. Because Apple doesn't recognize its own product name. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to get it to you. And my thought was the one change I wanted on the iMac that they didn't do was why don't they make the iMac like the studio display and sell it with the base foot stand or a vase amount option mm-hmm. or an adjustable stand mm-hmm. like the studio display. And they didn't do that. And I think it's too bad because although they would probably charge way too much for that adjustable stand, wouldn't it be nice if the iMac at least could be sold with an adjustable stand like yep. the pro display that would, or studio display? That would be nice. Yeah. But they didn't do it. They so didn't do so it. much for that jogging thought, running thought. But I just think that this is a product that like, kind of it kind of fits this i think it's yeah it's done it's i mean the, the, the truth is they de- they just redesigned it it's great that yeah. design is going to last a long time and they're going to just keep updating the chip every couple of years a couple three years it's fine it's good chi- good computer if you need an all-in-one the best world's best selling all-in-one <laughs> i don't know how many all-in-ones there are out there but this is one and it's the best one so you know and and i saw somebody complaining like well wow, halloween but there was not even an orange mac i'm like yes there was orange iMac it's still there it's good looking still get it uh but what it didn't bring was USB-C accessories we still you get in the box you get your lightning cable your braided lightning yep. cable for your that's lightning right. accessories color matched for your still color matched no. lightning accessories that's that is a surprise. right now okay they okay. need to update them at some point there's no doubt about it they clearly didn't bother this time Maybe they weren't ready. Maybe they're on a longer track. Maybe they got a bunch of them in the factory and they they need to sell them out (laughs) before they replace them. Uh, Lots of answers here. Maybe they so complicated the the, um, the supply chain with all the color matched items for the iMac that they can't change the color of the iMac because they've got all these keyboards and mice and they got to keep moving them out until they run out of them. I don't know. Um, I'm going to say this is another one of those areas where uh, tech podcasters and, and people who listen to tech podcasts are more concerned with the the neatness of Apple's product lineup than Apple is <laughs> uh, because Apple is not just concerned with with aesthetics. Apple is concerned with money. Mm-hmm. Um, I, 
I get the argument that like we're getting rid of lightning everywhere. Why is it not gone here? I would like them to revise these products, change where the mouse charges, put USB-C on them. That all said, these are not travel products that you take with you when you go on a trip and need to charge. These are sitting on a table somewhere products. And so for me, the, you know, the need for them to be updated off of lightning is, it just feels so much less. It's just, it's like, yeah, they need to do it. Do I think they need to do it right now? Do I think it's embarrassing that they haven't done it yet? I don't. I mean, like they need to do it. They will do it at some point. Um, I would have loved for them to do it now, yeah. but again, it, does it kill me every day that I use a trackpad that's attached via lightning or charged via lightning? It does not. <laughs> it's fine, right? It's fine. I would like the keyboard to get uh, redesigned to have the uh, inverted T, but they had a chance the last time and they didn't do it. So they may not care about that. You know, I would love a Touch ID trackpad. I don't think they're going to make one, but if they do, it's not now. And I would love them to change the charger on the, on the mouse. But, um, you know, it, it's clearly not a priority for them. And I understand why is what I'm saying. I, in the end... They know they need to do it eventually, but I don't think that every day that goes by that there are lightning uh, keyboards in iMac boxes, that it's an embarrassment to Apple or that it makes people's lives worse. I just don't. I think it's more that we all know that it's inevitable, but Apple is, you know, again, for complex reasons about the ability to redesign their accessories. We're right. We just, we just got the late pencil, right? Like Apple mm -hmm. is obviously having some issues with its accessory design and i you know having a, a pencil that works with your ipad it, or, and presumably having accessories that work with new ipads next year probably a higher priority than the thing you use to charge a keyboard that needs charging once a month right mm -hmm. so i'm okay with it a little disappointed but like i think we can i think we could overreact to the existence of a lightning keyboard or trackpad. I think I think it's it's going it, to it's fine. The world has not shifted. It's fine. They will fix it eventually. This episode is brought to you by Notion. There are so many tools out there that have AI in them these days and they're fun to play around with. But when it comes to something you can actually plug into your workflow and use regularly, Notion AI is the one that will help you really save time in your day-to-day -day work. You can leverage the power of AI right inside of Notion across all of your notes and documents without the need to jump between your work and a separate AI-powered tool. Notion AI is designed to help you with your work right in the place where you're doing your work. I have found this to be incredibly useful, actually. So with Cortex Brand, we use Notion extensively for all of our information. And I take notes for meetings that we do. So I write down, you know, I have an outline. I have some things I want to bring up and I make some notes. And then I use Notion AI at the end of the meeting, right inside of the same document. I say, give me some action items. And it goes through all of my notes and pulls out the things that I need to, to keep track of for next time. I find this to be super cool, super helpful. I've used it when writing marketing copy and I've asked it to look over it and, and make my grammar better. And it does all of that for me too. It's really, really cool. Notion AI will help you automate all of the tedious tasks like summarizing those meeting notes or finding the next steps that you're looking for and you're free to do the deep work you're best at and leave the rest to Notion AI. Whatever you're working on, Notion AI lets you skip to the good part. Save time, write faster by letting Notion AI handle the brainstorm part first or your first draft or to turn your messy notes into something more polished. You just tell Notion AI what you want to do. The more details, the better. Or start a prompt and go from there. Have it write a blog post, make an outline, brainstorm ideas, or summarize a whole bunch of documents for you. And you can use Notion AI to improve your writing, summarize pages, find action items, translate into any language, and so much more. All you need to do is select some text, click Ask AI, and increase your productivity like never before. I love that I can evoke it by a keyboard shortcut. That's one of the great things about Notion, you know, the way that you're able to connect things together and just use so much stuff with the keyboard to bring up this awesome menu of stuff and you can make things look really cool. I've really been enjoying my experience with Notion recently and Notion AI is helping that even better. 
Try Notion AI for free when you go to notion.com slash upgrade. That's all lowercase letters, N-O-T-I-O-N dot com slash upgrade to try out the incredible power of Notion AI today. And when you use our link, you're supporting our show. So try Notion AI for free right now at notion.com slash upgrade. Our thanks to Notion for their support of this show and Relay FM. Jason, I put a call out to the Upgradians and they yes. have come, they have they have answered with questions. So the answer oh, is questions. And we have a lot of Ask Upgrade today <laughs> to get through about <laughs> these products. The first question comes from Jeff. Jeff says, It seems like there's a lot more configurations for the new MacBook Pros. Many different CPU and GPU configurations a variety of memory options exclusive to each configuration. Do you think this is just a downside of how Apple is binning their chips or is there a strategic approach or user need that you think they're trying to solve? It's very complicated. Like if you go, so I'm, I'm on the page right now, right? To customize a 14 inch MacBook Pro, right? So I, I brought yep. up that page and I can do the M3 Pro with 12 CPU, 18 GPU, or I can do 14 and 30 or 16 and 40. Right, so but at the moment the top one is 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 selected twelve core CPU, eighteen core GPU. So then I look down to memory, and there are six options for RAM, but only two of them are available to me, <laughs> right? And there are four options for storage, but only three of them are available to me. And as I change to different CPU options, it then changes the amount of RAM that I'm able to choose and the storage I'm able to choose. Like mm-hmm. it is complicated now. Way more right. than ever before, I think. Yeah, yeah. So the reason the reason is twofold. It's in part that they are differentiating, right? The Max and the Pro. So those configs are going to be real different. And then, you know, the other part of it, I think, is that Apple, like the RAM is part of the chip. Right, it's not a it's not a BTO where they like pop a different SIM module in. It's on the chip, so I think they're making certain configs with certain RAM. I think is what they're doing. Yeah, <laughs> and and so this goes with that, and this goes with that. So you, it, it is it is more complex. It'll be interesting to see how they do it over time. I don't know where, um, where the binning fits in and whether they are binning if if it's just binning that's going on or if they're literally building different configurations and tying them to mm-hmm. different amounts also again the difference between pro and max is that pro has the three memory banks instead of uh, two on the max and yep. so the numbers are just the math is different if you go from pro to max so it's it's more complex and we'll have to learn what it is, but I think that there are. I think that probably there's binning going on here, and there are some choices that they're making about how they're manufacturing these. And we don't know the whole backstory here, but this is that brand new three nanometer process from TSMC. Mm-hmm. So who knows, like under the covers, what kind of weird complexities are going on in order for these things to ship? Um, that's going to be interesting. Maybe some of that will leak, or people will get these and tear them apart, and we'll start to get a better idea. Yeah, this is super weird. Like, I'm clicking around now, right? And then as you click to certain configurations, the minimum RAM changes. And then there are also, so like if I ch- uh, choose the 14 CPU, 30 core GPU, I now have two RAM options, but it's 36 and 96, like the ones in yes. the middle I can't choose. And like, right. I can also feel the. I can feel the meeting that went into a line which is on this page that says select M3 Max with 30 core GPU to add 96 gigabytes of memory. Select M3 Max with 40 core GPU to add 48, 64, or 128. Like that's a little note underneath the chip section where like someone was like, guys, this is too confusing. (laughs) We need to add a note here. People won't understand. And it is really weird, right? Then you choose the Mm -hmm. main one, sorry, the biggest one, the 16 core CPU, 40 core GPU. Then I can choose 48, 64, or 128. I can't get 96. Like it is right. odd when you start clicking through it this. Is. And, and it, I don't, uh, like for me, like if I was designing this page, I would not have the grayed out RAM visible on this page. Like, well, so it makes it me, get rid it of makes it. me think that maybe Apple isn't binning here and is actually just making some different configs. It feels like that. Right? 
yeah. right? That they they are making a forty core GPU max that has those RAM configurations, and then they're making a thirteen core one that has the different RAM configurations, and that's just how they've decided to do it. That's very. It's this is like which I allows them clicked around right? this page, and it yeah. is much more. It's much more. Uh, Daunting, I think, than yeah, than I little, thought before. The whack a mole game, mm. right? Yes, <laughs> it like, is. Like with that. this one, no, I want this one. No, no, it moved. No, no, it changed. Silly. Now the now the memory is different. Don't Why is it different? Silly. Don't be silly. Forty eight gigabytes feels like such a high starting point, but I guess you're already in. You know, when you go into the M three well, Max, you're, buy, you're already you're, in. You bought the Max Max, right? Yeah. What do you, you want? bought the Max Max at that point? Yeah. So you should. Get it, Max. Yep. It's max already it Max. Out. Max it out. They're helping you out. They're helping you max well, it's not even maxed out, but they're helping yeah. you max it a little bit. Yeah. I mean, at that point it's thirty six ninety nine to, mm-hmm. to start. Like it's yeah. <laughs> We've got about right? five or six variations of the following question. Alex okay. says with the M3's big focus on graphical performance, it seems like the perfect fit for the Vision Pro with all of the graphical computing that it has to do. Do you think Apple might say, just kidding, the Vision Pro is coming with the M3, M3 chip rather than the M2 chip? I don't think so. I think they designed it <laughs> like a year ago. Yeah. I think that it's... I don't think it, it is needs what it. it. Like it is. I, people, people, I've seen a lot of people, and in, again, in, in the questions and people online talking about it. Like, oh, surely it's going to be the M3. How could they release it and say it has an M2? Like, I just don't. Th- they didn't the build Pro. it for the M3. Like, also, do you yeah. know what? Like, the Vision Pro has the R1 chip. Other computers don't have that, right? Like, it, it, true. there's two chips in this product that's powering it. Is what we know, right? And. I just feel like there's no need to desire a different chip in it than the one that it has. Like they have made it with that it. in mind. And so And with the power envelope in mind it. and the heat envelope in yeah. mind and all of those things about it, that's what it's for. Plus you're right, it's got the R1 chip in there. And again, when the Vision Pro comes out, I doubt that people are gonna be like, but M2, they're gonna be like, oh, Vision Pro, right? Like that's But it's like they you know, also didn't put the M two Max in there, did they? You know, like they, I, I, <laughs> Right, like true. they they had more power available to them if they wanted it, but they decided to settle and build around a certain configuration. About the M2. Look, they might do it. I doubt it. They might, but I doubt it. I just think that it's not. I don't think it's worth worrying about. Right, like no. if for example, if they'd never told you that it had an M2 in it, then you wouldn't be worried, right? If they said like it has an R1 and an F2 in it or whatever. You'd just be like, oh, well, they're the Vision Pro chips. Like, you just wouldn't think about it. I don't have an M2 in my AirPods. You know, like it's, it's like it, uh, the, the, the products have what they have and they design them for that. I wouldn't worry too much about one, about it being where it is. Because as well, like, when the Vision Pro comes out, there's still going to be a lot of computers that still have an M2 in them, including the Mac Pro. So, yeah, that's going to stick around for a while, <laughs> I mm-hmm. expect. Jordan says, for the M3 series, why do you think Apple emphasized the power savings and efficiency when seemingly the same process received no power saving mention in the A17 Pro chip for the iPhone? Could it be the efficiency gains are only apparent when scaled up to Mac performance level? Perhaps it could be meaningful for the iPad? I think Apple is focused on comparing itself to PC laptops and especially PC laptops, but also past Apple laptops Mm -hmm. and showing off the fact that they, this is the game, right? Like they may not, some laptops may be able to beat them in GPU uh, overall, but not at, you know, not at the power level. And that's the thing that they are, they're trying to say it's for battery life and running it with uh, not plugged in and being able to do it. And I think it's just a key part of how they do Mac marketing is to do it that way. Um, I think they're less concerned about it for the iPhone than they are for the Mac. So I think it's, I, I do think it's that simple. And it is, you know, I've heard people say this, I think it is interesting that the M3 process in the A17 Pro did not seem to change the efficiency of the iPhone. Right? Like battery life did yeah, not improve. Yeah. But then also, you know, Ben Thompson's been talking about this a lot. It's stuff that I don't completely understand, but that. This M3, uh, sorry, this this three nanometer chip in the Mac is not the same three nanometer process that the iPhone chip was made from. We we don't know, but that's it what sounds he's been like saying. it's po- 
it's yeah. possible that this is this new TSMC process that is going to ship in the fall, which is now. Um, it's possible that this is a different process than is than the A17 uh, Pro chip. We we don't we don't know, but it is possible that that's the case. This episode is brought to you by Vitaly. Customer success teams are facing a problem today. How do they connect customer data back to their work? Vitaly changes that. It's a new kind of customer success platform, an all-in-one collaborative workspace that combines your customer data with all of the capabilities you expect from today's project management and work platforms. Because it's designed for today's customer success team, that is why Vitaly operates with unparalleled efficiency, improves net revenue retention, and delivers best-in-class customer experiences. It's the solution to helping your customer success teams keep a better pulse on your customers, which maximizes productivity, visibility and collaboration you can boost your bottom line by driving more revenue per customer with vitally and if you take a qualified demo of vitally you'll get a free pair of airpods pro so if you're a customer success decision maker actively seeking cs solutions working at a b2b software as a service company with 50 to 1000 employees and you're willing to explore changing customer success platforms if you already have one in place schedule your call by visiting vitally.io slash upgrade and get that free pair of airpods pro that is v-i-t-a-l-l-y dot io slash upgrade vitally dot io slash upgrade for a free pair of airpods pro when you schedule a qualified meeting a thanks to vitally for their support of this show and relay fm next question comes from carter do you think that apple not updating the imac accessories of USB-C means that we might see a more significant revision of these accessories when they do update them uh maybe I think that's not a bad thing. Like the idea is why, and we we should say a lot of people are like, but the EU banned Lightning. It's like that's not the case. Existing products can continue to be sold. It's new products that they want to have USB C. Um, so it doesn't. They can keep these for as long as they want. I I think there's something to Carter's question here, which is Apple seems to want to only update these when they are motivated to. And if you're going to go through a cycle, especially since we know when you redesign a keyboard, trackpad, or mouse on for Apple, it's for like a decade. They don't update them very often at all. Um, I think there have essentially only been two generations of Magic Trackpad, <laughs> right? And that goes back like 15 years. Um, so maybe even longer, uh, 20 years. I, it, it, they last forever. So when you do it, it should matter. Now, they did update the Magic Keyboard because they wanted to do Touch ID. Mm -hmm. And so they did that. So I guess that's the question is if Apple's going to make a new mouse, are they going to just put the USB-C hole in where the lightning hole is? Or are they going to be like, no, 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 new mouse. Let's make this. What do we know about people using Macs today who have a mouse and what can we do there? And, and trackpad the same way. Like what about the magic trackpad that's current could be better uh, is it the Bluetooth in it? Is it the uh, the touch sensor? Can, is there something to be done there? Could there be an under glass touch ID? Um, all of these things are possible. I'm sure they have those conversations. And yeah, I think there's something to that idea, Carter, that you don't need to change them. And when you do change them, you very rarely get the opportunity. So if you're going to do it, make it last and have it be a real update. Otherwise, why are you even doing it? But I, I think that that could be the answer is that if all they were going to do was slap USB-C ports onto the existing ones, they, they maybe could have done that. But at that point, you're opening the box and you're changing the equipment inside and, it, and you should probably do a more substantive update than that. And please, Touch ID, you know, Touch ID trackpad. Maybe that's why we can we can dream, you know. I mean, that's my dream, dream is is that all these rumors about Apple trying to get Touch ID to be under a, a surface were not for the iPhone, but they're mm -hmm. they're they're, they're going to use that. They're going to deploy it in the one place where it really should be, which is on an external trackpad. They're not going to do it, but would dream, dare to dream. Wouldn't that be nice? Jeff asks, we didn't see a bigger iMac nor a bigger iPad this year. Which do you think will be released first? Which do you think could be more appealing to customers and which would be more appealing to you? Bigger Mac, bigger iMac, bigger iPad. So we'll say iMac oh. Pro, bigger iPad Pro. 
I am a user of a big iPad Pro. I am intrigued by the idea of a bigger iPad Pro, although I don't think I would get it. Um, mm. And iMac, I have bought big iMacs in the past. At this point, I'm pretty much in the studio display with a Mac Studio lifestyle or studio display with a MacBook Air lifestyle. So I... I think a bigger iPad is likely to happen sooner because, you know, Mark Gurman wrote about like bigger iPad is something that they're thinking about and bigger iMac is something that they've sort of set aside and they might think about doing it, but it's not going to be for a couple of years at least. I've heard through the grapevine that like they ran the numbers and they're like, it doesn't make sense to make this product and they've set it aside. But Gurman says they're still sort of thinking about it, but it's more like a 2025 thing. Um, so I think maybe bigger iPad is going to happen sooner. Uh, I think more appealing to con most consumers is going to be a bigger iPad because I think that a giant, I, or, I mean, is a big iMac because I think a giant iPad is a very specific use case. I think it could be cool for artists uh, and, and, you know, other people who want that giant canvas. But for most people, I think, you know, the I, a big iMac sold well in the past and could sell well again in the future. Mm -hmm. Neither of them is particularly appealing to me at this point. More appealing to me is a bigger iMac. Like, that's a product that I would consider buying. Um, like an, an iMac Pro, basically, right? Um, yeah. I think Apple's sooner to release a bigger iPad than a bigger iMac. And I think they would sell more big iPads than they would sell big iMacs today. Interesting. Okay. I just think, in general, they, they sell more. Well, they, they sell have more sold iPads more than iPads. Macs. And, and yeah. I, I think that when it comes to Macs, people want laptops now, right? Primarily, more than anything else. And I think a big iPad could maybe be something that people would be excited about. And right. it might be one of those things that, I don't know, sells well at the beginning, um, but probably wouldn't <laughs> over time. <laughs> maybe it would taper off. Swifty says, do you think we are finally starting to see hints of a regular update schedule for Macs and M series chips? <sighs> One can hope. No. <laughs> One can hope. I I think I think it all comes down to the chip generations, right? So we had our you know, the chip generations seem to be going in 18 months ish mm -hmm. intervals. Um I yeah I don't know if if everything is almost everything on an eighteen month schedule or not like not the iMac but everything else maybe maybe but uh, I I think that the the MacBook Pro coming out now less than a year is different and the Pro chips coming out now in Max chips instead of in the spring is different um so. We have more data, but I don't know if if we can sift through the noise to find out what Apple's ideal is. Yeah. Um, Apple's ideal is probably every 18 months for the Mac and laptops on that 18-month cycle and desktops on either an 18-month cycle or a 36-month cycle is my guess. Um, but I, I'm still not sure. Like, I'm still not sure... I thought the Mac Studio wasn't going to get updated in M2. And in fact, they did, and they did the Mac Pro. So is there an M3 Pro and Ultra, or Max and Ultra, Mac Studio, and Mac Pro? I think I'm I'm the kind of person, actually, who believes that now that Apple has its own chips, Apple actually does want to update all its computers with its new chips. I actually do believe that's the case. Yeah. I think Apple wants... If, if it's an 18-month cycle, Apple does want a new Mac Pro every 18 months and does want a new Mac Studio every 18 months. I think that that's the ideal. And that when something like the iMac goes a generation, I think it's because of timing reasons or because it's a lower priority and something else came in front of it. And the stuff that matters most to them, which is the MacBook Air and MacBook Pro, those are going to be in every single cycle. So we're starting to see it, but there's still some noise in this. So... Uh, but 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 to answer uh, Swifty's question, hints. I mean, we've seen hints of it, but like, I'm not positive. But it feels like Apple wants this chip cycle to be 18 months and wants all its major products updated within each cycle. I hope because I just like it. But and and, yeah. and and I and I'm confident that they would like it too. But it doesn't seem like it's been 
smooth sailing, but the difference is when it isn't, they have more levers they can pull than when it was with Intel, right? Like when Intel wasn't smooth sailing, everything just came to a grinding halt for a long time. Yeah. And at least Apple is able to do whatever they are able to do and maybe have more leverage than they mm-hmm. did in the Intel relationship to make right. it work the way they want. But I think they'd be more than happy to just put their new chip in in every product in their line and every generation. I think that that is, at least so far, I think that's the goal. That seems to be the goal. And it may not always work out, but I think that's the goal, right? It's hard not to look at the all the accolades that they have thrown out there for the M3 Max and not imagine that next year there will be an M3 Max Studio and an M3 Max Mac Pro. Like it's, it's or an M3 Ultra uh-huh. Mac Pro. It's just very hard to imagine that 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 they would be like, no, 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 we'll just wait for the M4. Like, I just, I don't think that's what they want to do unless there's a problem, right? Something that comes up. And I think that's what happened with the iMac where they're like, we just, you know, missed it. <laughs> and now it's the first of the next generation instead because we that's where we are now. And finally, Tim wants to know what we think the default laptop's going to be now for most people. Is it going to be this M3 MacBook Pro or is it going to be the M2 MacBook Air? I think the default laptop is the MacBook Air because of the price. I think it should be. Like this is, I've been banging this drum for ages that I think the M2 MacBook Air is like the best computer ever and people should just use that. I just don't know if corporate is going to change. Maybe the price well, will make them change, <laughs> right? But but no, here's the so thing. Expensive. It's default laptop. Like the MacBook Air sells sold better than the 13-inch MacBook Pro did. Yeah. The the, the MacBook Air is the default laptop. I yeah. think there's nothing here in introducing a more expensive MacBook Pro base model that will rest any uh you know, championship built away from from the yeah. MacBook Air. It's still going to be the champion. In fact, I think it's going to be more so the champion because some percentage of people who would have bought a thirteen ninety nine or twelve or yeah twelve ninety nine MacBook Pro with a Touch Bar, some percentage of them are not going to buy that fifteen ninety nine MacBook Pro fourteen inch. They're going to go to the MacBook Air, mm-hmm. and and you know you've got. Twelve ninety nine for the fifteen inch. So there's your twelve ninety nine price point, right? It's the fifteen inch air, and then there's the thirteen inch air at ten ninety nine. And I realize there are going to be some buyers, people, and corporations who don't want to buy a MacBook Air, and they're going to probably bite the bullet and go for that fifteen ninety nine Pro. But like, I think it's Apple's hope, and I share this hope that. Some of those buyers look at that 15 inch air specifically because I think that there's it's not just a bias against the pro versus air name. I think it's a bias against small screens. So it's an air, but it's a 15 inch air. I think Apple's hoping that they will make some inroads into corporate sales with that product too. Yeah, that'd be fun. And I would right? love to know <laughs> if this I would is love how to they the sell percentage. the 15-inch Air is by introducing yeah. a more expensive MacBook Pro. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would love to know the percentage of potential uh, MacBook Pro buyers at the low end who go to the more expensive Pro versus go to the 15-inch Air versus go to the 13-inch Air. I wonder what that will be. But I do think that those buyers will get scattered across those. I think the the air is still the default and will, in fact, yes, be a higher percentage of Apple's total laptop sales than before because some of those MacBook Pro buyers will fall out uh, going from, from $1299 to $1599. They will fall out and go to the air instead. If you would like to send us your questions for a future episode, please go to UpgradeFeedback.com. You can also send in your follow-up for us there as well. You can check out Jason's articles about these products, and I'm sure more writing about them over the coming weeks over at SixColors.com. You can hear Jason's shows here on Relay FM and at TheIncomparable.com. You also find me here on Relay FM and check out my work at CortexBrand.com. You can find us on Mastodon. Jason is at jsnell on zeppelin.flights and I am at imike, I-M-Y-K-E on mike.social. The show is on Mastodon as upgrade at relayfm.social. You can watch video clips of the show on TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube. We are at Upgrade Relay and on our YouTube channel at the moment, full video episodes if that's your bag. We're on threads. I am iMike. Jason is at jsnell. 
Thank you to our members who support us of Upgrade Plus. You can get longer ad-free versions of the show each and every week, even when we do bonus episodes like the mini draft by uh, going to getupgradeplus.com, just $5 a month or $50 a year. Thank you to our members who help make this show possible, along with our sponsors. This week it's Vitally, Notion, Delete Me, and Ladder. We'll be back next week for some money, 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 money talk because it's earnings time. Money, money, money. Charge, charge, charge. Thank you for listening to this episode of Upgrade. We'll be back next time. Until then, say a spooky goodbye, Jason. Ah, goodbye. Ah!